This program is brought to you by the friends and partners of Biblical Life TV. Deep waters to nurture and empower the remnant for the last days. There is a power that is about ready to be released from heaven to those that seek after the things of the kingdom of God. When it comes to the word of God, there is a supernatural unction of the Holy Spirit to learn. God is up to something for those that will study to show yourself approved. Right now there's a lot of things in the kingdom that God is trying to establish that goes against people's theology. You need to understand your roots, where you came from. God may require us to change what we're doing to make walking in the kingdom a higher priority than it ever was before. We were never called to have a little light. We were called to be ablaze with the fire of God in this generation. Join the remnant from around the world who are empowered by the word of God to fulfill God's purpose in these last days. God is speaking something different. That is going to be essential in the days ahead. And that's part of this anointing that we have to have. Prepare yourselves for spirit-filled teaching. Biblical Life TV. I'm about saying my voice out this morning. But you know, as, as I was up there worshiping, God kept showing me the new building done. And I, there's a fire building on the inside of me. I see people from all over the Ozarks coming. I see people getting set on fire for God like never before and bringing biblical balance to the body. I already kind of wish I was there. <laughs> but it's going to be an act of functional faith, and that's what we're dealing with this morning, is developing functional faith. And I've got enough notes here for at least two sessions and much of the body, the, the problem has been that there has been a disconnect from our belief system and our action system. We have been too Greco-Roman in our mentality concerning spiritual things, and we try to compartmentalize. Do you ever see the, I remember when I was a kid, they had the cafeteria trays, and none of the food ever touched, you know, this here and this here and this here. That, that's very Greco-Roman. It's very Hebraic to have a stew. <laughs> that it, so that every part of our lives is enhanced by the other parts of our lives. You know, there, there's something, in, and I love chili, but you know, when you get the right onions and the right jalapenos and just the right thing, every ingredient enhances the other so that it becomes almost a culinary melody in your mouth. You know, that's good food. Not some, not some of the stuff you find in a can, but real food, okay? That's the way our faith is supposed to be. That when I go from faith to faith and glory to glory, that what God does in my spirit permeates into my soul, permeates into my flesh, and begins absolutely governing my very conduct. Functional faith is very much like having a functional weapon in the time of war. You don't wait for war to break out to find your weapon and see if it's been maintained or not, or if you have any bullets or not. You better have done all that long before and maintained yourself. In the hard times, our faith is tested, and by that what I'm talking about is being like taken to a proving ground, and the weapons of your faith are tested. Like Daniel at the lion's den or Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego at the fiery furnace. You don't wait to those moments to develop faith. If you don't develop faith before you get there, how many know that you end up a crispy critter? But in the ease that we have within Western society, we have made this disconnect that I can believe all this stuff, but to be truthful, it's not real enough to affect how you think and what you do. And that, that is a lie of the enemy, and it has sabotaged the, the strength of the body of Christ. We have turned it into theater. We've even replaced the glory of God showing up with a fog machine. How many know the glory of God is not made by frigid air? 
You can't flip a switch and it's there. But I'm going to prophesy this. In the days to come, for people who have purified themselves and have developed functional faith, we are going to enter into a time that the glory of God is going to begin manifesting in their midst again. And why am I excited about that? Because the priests of God could not stand to minister when Solomon dedicated the temple. It will be a God thing that we're not going to be able to point to Mike Lake or to Carl Gollops or to Tom Horn or to any other minister and say they were so anointed that this was done. It's going to be known that Jesus was in the house and that lives were changed, broken bodies were healed and lives were restored and brought back into the kingdom in proper balance. Now, none of that's in my notes. We see over and over again in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul, which I believe wrote, wrote the book of Hebrews. There's actually evidence not only is or things conceptually very Paulinistic in the writing style, but many commentators in their honesty will tell you that there's a good chance that it was actually attached to the book of Galatians. So if it's like the addendum, there was no need for an introduction because it was actually done at the beginning of Galatians. He first corrects the Gentiles, and now he's correcting the Shemai Pharisees in the book of Hebrews. If Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17... The Apostle Paul proclaims this. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God. Now, you need to underline that in your Bible. What I have found is if you try to preach Moses without Christ, there's no power in it. Something changed at the cross. Now, what does the cross do to Moses? It sets it on fire with the power of God. How many know this is one book? We as believers, we have been anointed to walk in the commandments. And so through Christ and the power that comes with the true gospel, the gospel of the kingdom, we have a supernatural ability to walk in the commandments of God because Jesus is now living and reigning on the inside of us. And I, I like what Carl Koch said years ago when he met with Ariel Sharon. Few people realize that in Israel, the prime minister is also in charge of all the religious activities in Israel. And so he's meeting with Sharon and he's talking about the commandments and the feasts. And, and Ariel Sharon is confused. He said, I thought you were a Christian. He says, I am. But when I got saved, this Jew moved on the inside of me. <laughs> Caused him to raise his eyebrows just a little bit. And that happened to all of us if we're truthful and our theology doesn't get in the way with what is actually taught in the Word of God. Okay? It is the power of God. If Jesus is not the epicenter, God pulls the fuse and there'll be no power. But when Jesus is the epicenter, the word of God from Genesis to Revelation explodes with power and with meaning. That's not in my notes either. For it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes. For the Jew first and also for the Greek. How many know that I just love that he put the also in there? That's how I got in. For the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith and is written, the just shall live by faith. And I have heard that preached so many different ways, and very few of them have been correct. That you have turned faith into a force that works as a Santa Claus in your life? That's not at all what it's talking about here. Let's go to the next one, Galatians chapter 3 and verse 11. We're going to go hopping all over the Word of God today. I may actually get through this whole thing today. When you preach it, it actually goes a lot quicker than when you teach it. But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evidence for the just shall live by faith. Now we're going to unpack that here just in a minute to see what the Apostle Paul was talking about. Because that again is so misinterpreted. The law, Old Testament or New Testament, never delivered anybody. 
It was not its purpose. Moses did not give the Torah to Israel when they were in Egypt to get them set free. He gave it to a free people that were no longer controlled by Egypt and had to learn how to walk in the kingdom. The same that we have today. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 10, verses 36 and 39. I'm trying to paint a picture for you of what it means to walk by faith. Starting in verse 36, For you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. Yet for a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Underline that in your Bible, because man, we're closer to that than we have ever been. You know, when the Father says go, Jesus isn't going to piddle in heaven. <laughs> I, I can see him like a marathon runner at the, this, I mean, he's, he's down and he's ready. So that when, he, when the time has come, it's going to be hard to keep up with him. That's why we need horses. <laughs> Because he's ready. He will not tarry. Verse 30, Now the just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition. So faith here is not about getting a new home, getting a new car. Well, brother, you drew back from believing that God was going to give you that mansion. I already got a mansion. Why do I need one here? One of these days, I'm going to leave everything that I accumulate in this life here. And hopefully, what I but if the Lord tarries, I hope what I'm going to accumulate is things that are going to bless the body that can be left in, in my wake, that can help the next generation. Physical things don't matter. Is it nice to have nice things? Well, it sure is handy. Every time I pass the Amish on the buggy, I, I thank God for my car. They're out there and it's raining and they're trying to get underneath the umbrella and stuff. I thank God for my car. And as it's getting winter, I thank God for the heater in my car. I found out the other day when I used the auto start, the steering wheel heats up and the seats heat up. I almost broke out in tongues the first morning I went out there. <laughs> All right. That's not what it's talking about here. It's talking about our walk with God. Now, I want to bring clarity to Galatians chapter 3 and verse 11. I want to do that by reading out of the complete Jewish Bible because it brings a Hebraic mindset. We do not realize, everybody heard of Acts chapter 15 where the council had to figure out what in the world they're going to do with the Gentiles? It is precipitated by a perversion of the Torah that was done by the Shammai Pharisees, the school of Shammai. And the school of Shammai, their motto, if you will, was the letter of the law, where Paul was from an entirely different school for the Pharisees called the school of Hillel, and their motto was the spirit of the law. What was God teaching us when he gave us this so that we can apply it properly spiritually? And so they went and they created this doctrine that Jesus could not save a Gentile. That you had to physically become Jewish first through circumcision, and then and only then could you trust in Messiah. They did, not, they did not have any concept of spiritual circumcision of the heart rather than of the flesh. And so he's dealing with their error because they were so hard set and so hard nosed about what they were going to do, they gave no room to proper interpretation of what God had even prophesied. Right after all of Israel was circumcised, they did something stupid. And Almighty God responds, Oh, I wish I would have circumcised their hearts and not their flesh. It's like, Oh, I wish I was already on the other side of the cross. Because of what they did. And so we're dealing with these issues. Now this is the complete Jewish Bible. For everyone who depends on legalistic observance of the Torah commands lives under a curse since it is written. Cursed is anyone who does not keep on doing everything written in the scroll of the Torah. So if you're trusting in that instead of the blood covenant, I do not keep one single commandment 
to be saved except to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now that I am saved, I look at the commandments as God's software to help me walk in the kingdom. It's also the antivirus for Mystery Babylon. Because I have been walking like an Egyptian. I have been thinking like an Egyptian. That's what all of us did before we got saved. Let's go on. Now it is evident that no one comes to be declared righteous by God through legalism, since the person who is righteous will attain life by trusting and being faithful. That's how he interprets the just shall live by faith. The righteous person is justified. He is declared righteous, just like Abraham was when God called him out of Babylon. He believed God, and he put his feet to his devotion. That act of believing God, even when he was old and it was physically impossible for him to have a child through Sarah, he believed God and he hoped against hope. And God says, that's righteousness. Not only did he trust in, but he kept being faithful in his beliefs so that it controlled his actions. Furthermore, legalism is not based on trusting and being faithful, but of a misuse of the text that says, anyone who does these things obtains life through them. The Messiah redeemed us from the curse pronounced in the Torah by becoming a curse on our behalf, for the Tanakh says, anyone who hangs from a stake comes under a curse. Jesus, or Yeshua the Messiah, did this so that in union with him the Gentiles might receive the blessing pronounced to Abraham, so that through trusting and being faithful, so that by trusting and being faithful, we might receive what was promised, namely the Spirit. In the Torah, both Old Testament and New, no one was ever saved by keeping the commandments. It was only given to a free people. Now, in all these three sections that Paul uses the term, the just shall live by faith, he was quoting Habakkuk. Now, what's interesting, the whole time of years, decades and decades ago, when I was in the faith movement, is the just shall live by faith, time to believe for stuff. This is the, what they did. None of them would go back to Habakkuk for the Hebrew definition of what it meant for the just shall live by faith. This is Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 2 through 4. Then the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain with tablets, that he may run who reads it. For the vision is not yet, is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak. Uh oh, uh oh. How many know we're at the end? In fact, the last days began on the day of Pentecost after the resurrection of Messiah. That is what was proclaimed by Peter. That was his first sermon. Last days are in gear, guys. I'm going to start pouring out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters are going to prophesy and do all these things. I still refuse to dream dreams. I have nighttime visions because I don't consider myself old yet. You know, I know it's semantics, but hey. So there were things in Habakkuk, and he was prophesying what we're walking in now. So, and we're supposed to run with it. He was speaking of what would happen in the wake of Messiah and his completed work at Calvary. Okay? But at the end it will speak and will not lie. Uh-oh. So the preaching of the cross is not a lie. That's a slap in a lot of rabbis' faces right there because it's speaking today. And though it tarries, wait for it. Because it will surely come, it will not tarry. Behold the proud... For his soul is not upright in him. I mean, right there, that's the deep state. That's the swamp. That's everything that's going wrong in Western society. We need to realize that the concept of progressivism, socialism, communism is an occult mind virus of Mystery Babylon. And it attacks the biblical stance of things. You see in China right now, the ruling class are communistic, but one of their fears is their nation is quickly becoming Christian. 
that within 10 to 20 years, they will become the extreme minority in China. And so their response is to kill the believers, to tear down their churches, to put them in re-education camps. And if they refuse to be re-educated, they're literally harvesting their organs to put them on the black market. That's what communism does because it's from the pits of hell. How in the world did I get into that? Oh, they're not upright on the inside. They're upside down. And the worldview is upside down, and there's no logic to it. I heard one of our new senators or representatives, I'm not going to say this individual's name, but what they said was, I wish there was some historical evidence so that we could examine what happens when you implement communism. Russia, China, Venezuela, Pol Pot, Mao, 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 Mao. Come on now. History is replete and it never turns out well. That's the ignorance stuck on steroids. They refuse to see. Well, if we can just get it done right, it will create a paradise. It creates hell everywhere it goes. And the reason they come after true Christian community is true Christian community lived the way that it's supposed to bring such blessing that they have nothing to compare with it. I remember reading the stories of Watchman Nee that lived in China as communism began to take over. And communism came in, the communist leaders came into his village and he's sitting there shoveling dung or whatever he was doing. I mean, he was doing the work of something very servantile. And they said, where is your leader? I'm the leader. No, 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 no. You may be leader of the dung hill. We're looking for the community leader. This is a Christian community. I'm the servant. I'm the leader. They could not wrap their heads around what he was saying. And so since they couldn't duplicate that, Christianity became the enemy. And one of the things I'm marveling at, and, and watch me, a lot of things he writes, he writes from an Oriental rather than from a Western mindset. And it takes a little while to be able to tweak your brain to think the way that he thought. But I marvel that some of his books he wrote while he was in prison and just the hundreds and hundreds of scriptures that he quoted, he had to do them all at memory. In fact, when he wrote his last books, because of what they had done to him, he was blind. And yet he was able to quote scripture after scripture after scripture as he dictated the word that those around him transcribed. May we have that kind of tenacity in the kingdom. He was faithful. He refused to be re-educated. See, I'm in a re-education process right now. My mind is being washed by the water of the Word. And I am flushing Mystery Babylon down the drain, never to get back in there again. Let's look at what it says here in the Complete Jewish Bible, look at the proud. He is inwardly not upright. The righteous will attain life through trusting faithfully. Trusting faithfully. That he's constantly trusting in his relationship with God. He's trusted in this word and what the word says is to be lived. He's constantly looking at that. I like the amplified. Look at the proud. His soul is not straight or right within him. So next time you see a, see a liberal, just say to your neighbor, he ain't right. <laughs> and something does not right about him, all right? But the rigidly just and the uncompromisingly righteous man shall live by his faith and in his faithfulness. Now the Hebrew word there for faith is imuna, which is not only translated firmness, but fidelity, fidelity, he is faithful to the covenant. He walks in fidelity to the covenant, not of the things of this world. There's something about the Marine Corps I love. You see, the Marine Corps is directly connected to the hip of the President of the United States, not like the other armed forces. The President can bypass 
the Department of Defense and activate the, and activate the Marines and all the generals have to stop and get out of his way because that's his band is the Marine Corps. Bet you didn't know that about the Marine Corps. I like a Marine. What's their slogan? Simplify, always faithful. Fidelity, always faithful. You're faithful to the president. You are faithful to the Constitution of the United States. And woe be to anything that comes between you and your faithfulness. We need to have Marines in the kingdom that are faithful to their king and his word. And whether it costs them their life, we, we read the hall of faith in the book of Hebrews. Now some saw outstanding miracles. The, the apostle says, listen, they even received their dead, raised from the dead. They saw miracle after miracle after miracle. But there are those that challenge us because they were faithful to the point of death. But even with death, they refused to compromise. And they are in God's hall of faith. They struggled even to the point of death. I think with ISIS and doing the things that they did in the Middle East as they were cutting off the believers' heads, the last thing that came out of their mouths was the name of Jesus. Compare that to America. They hurt my feelings. I don't think I'm going to go back. You poor baby. Maybe the preacher needs to not only stomp on your toes, but slap you upside the head a couple of times to bring you to publicity. Because you're stuck on stupid. The Apostle Paul said, All Scripture is given for doctrine. That does not mean to create a systematic theology, nor does it talk about the creed on your wall. Hebraically, the Word of God is to teach you how to live. You walk this way, you don't walk this way. And secondly, it's for correction. If your church isn't correcting you, they're not doing their job. No one is ever going to confuse me of not correcting and rebuking when I need to. But how many know I do it because I love everybody? And I'm faithful to my king, which is the way it should be. Imuna means firmness, fidelity, steadfastness, even steadiness. Why is that important? Why is that important? The book of Hebrews prophesies there's another shaking coming. We see that shaking in the book of Revelation that not only does the systems of the earth shake, but the systems in the second heaven are going to shake to the very core and anything not of God is going to be thrown down. How can we walk through that? Because we walk in a kingdom that cannot be shaken. That in my fidelity to the word and to my king, I have a supernatural steadiness to me that I cannot be shaken even when God tears the very foundations of Babylon down and all the earth is weeping because Babylon has fallen. I'm going to say glory to God. About time that thing comes down. That's what it's referring to here. That's how you get through the hard times. You got to develop it now. Now I want to deal with the scope of Torah. Linguistically speaking, Torah in Hebrew can be translated as law in English. However, when you start dealing with translations, transliterations, the problem is that culture and cultural understanding never translate. Otherwise, some paragraphs in the Word of God would be 20, 30, 40 pages long. We cannot understand the word from a Greco-Roman mindset. It was not given from that. Even when they wrote it in Greek, they were thinking like Hebrews. That's why such a vital part of the exegesis process is you've got to consider culture. 
We've got to hear with the ears that they heard at their time. How many know Jesus didn't walk the, the, the hills of Tennessee? He never preached in Atlanta. Even though in the east they think that is the hub to get to heaven, you have to go through Atlanta if you die anywhere on the east coast. We have got to learn that we have to hear with Hebrew ears to understand the Word of God. Now, to the Hebrew law means one thing, to the Greco-Roman and its culture law means something completely different. You talk to a Jewish person about the law of God, they start doing this. It's exciting. You talk to somebody in the Western world about law, and it's a burden. You know, there are so many laws and regulations on the book that you can't walk outside without at least violating 10 federal laws. Because you breathed and carbon dioxide came out of your mouth, you're probably violating a law right now. The Greeks and the Romans understood this and how burdensome it could be and how it could be manipulated by the elite to oppress everybody else for the sake of power. Anybody understand that going on in today? And so when we see law, we think of Washington, D.C., and, and somehow or another we throw Moses into the mix. But the Hebrew language is very visual, and it is intended to paint a picture within the minds of the hearer. In fact, when you, even when you look at the original Hebrew itself, each letter was a pictograph. That's why one of the neatest ways of interpreting is to go back and look at what each letter meant. And many times it'll actually give you a more accurate definition than the lexicon. Really neat stuff because everything was visual within the Hebrew mindset. And so when you look at the word Torah, you see an archer drawing back his bow and he has the ability because he has developed the skill and the instruction to fire that arrow and it always hits the bullseye or the mark. We dealt with that here, how that John talked about sin was missing the mark. Okay. The other aspect of Torah was a father sitting down with his children and providing loving instruction so they would grow up and have a blessed life. That's what Torah means, the loving instruction of the father that helps you to hit the mark so that you always please him. Now how ridiculous would it be if I said we have been redeemed from the, from the loving instruction of the father that makes sure that we have a blessed life and that we always make him happy. How many know that would be moronic? The Apostle Paul was dealing with what they had done with it. Just like all you got to do is turn on Christian television. Look what they've done to the New Testament. You don't think that same religious spirit did stuff with the Old Testament? I hate religious spirits. But when you look at how the, the concept of Torah became more than the Pentateuch or the five books of Moses within the Hebraic mindset, that as the Word of God began to develop, you had, the, you had the Navaim, you had the prophets, which God is still giving instruction. And so within the mindset of the Hebrew people, the, 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 the uh, prophets were considered as part of the Torah. Now in the times of Jesus, the Ketuvim, the writings were still in flux. I deal with that in my second book, how that it was almost to around the next century, right, right around 90, 100, 110 A.D., the Ketuvim was not canonized. And because of Jesus is probably one of the reasons why the book of Enoch and the book of Jasher and some of the pseudopiglypha writings were not considered canon by the rabbis because it created such a messianic fervor that it produced Jesus. And so when they rejected Jesus, they had to set those books aside when they were canonizing the writings. But Hebraically, and even for the early church, Genesis through Malachi was considered the loving instruction of God. That was the scripture. That was the Torah, the loving instruction. Now in this day, how many know that we have, we have the roof to God's building Torah, the foundation, the writings and the prophets, the walls, and the Brit Hadashah is the roof to the edifice that God was building. 
And for us, how many know that the instruction of the Father continued? So when we're dealing with concepts of what Torah was supposed to be for the believer, it goes Genesis all the way to the book of Revelation. It is one book of loving instruction of the Father given to us so that we could walk in fidelity to the kingdom in this life. Does that make sense? Okay. But guys, what we needed was a software upgrade. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 4. I've got 13 minutes left. I may get this whole thing done today. That's why we cannot unhinge the church from the Old Testament. Nor can we unhinge the Messianic movement from the New Testament. Sometimes I, I, get, I almost get whiplash because I'm fighting half the church to begin opening up the Old Testament. And then within the Hebraic Roots movement, I'm fighting with them to open up the Gospels. I make heads explode when I tell me you want to learn how to live Torah? Read the Gospels and see how Jesus did it because he's the perfect pattern. Heads explode. Don't ever mention Paul. My word. You think they're going to have a heart attack. <gasps> well, you don't understand him right. Ta Paul was very Torah-centric. He was just teaching it using the concept of the spirit of the law to help Gentiles begin moving in their faith. So we have both sides of the aisle going, Ethel, every time I speak. Verse 17, you found that yet? This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk. Underline that in your Bible. There's to be a difference between the way you walk and the way the rest of the world walks. Then why is the church looking for everything that becomes popular and we run out and try to do it whether it's getting tattoos or whatever other thing that they do. We run out and we do so. We say, see, we're just like you. We're supposed to be different. Now, I don't care what you do before you got saved. Just don't be stuck on stupid after you get saved. We're to walk different. Some people have confessed, Mike Lake is different, so maybe I'm being biblical. Do not walk like the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their minds, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their hearts, who, being past feeling, have given themselves over to lewdness, to work all uncleanness with greediness. Well, that sounds like D.C. again. But you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him, as truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning the former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man which is created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. In the spirit of your mind. You see, when Adam and Eve sinned, man's minds was infected with a virus called the iniquity force. Man no longer thought right. And it didn't take very long to get out of the garden that Cain ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and he was going to decide for himself his way of redemption and what was right and what was wrong. And he said, it's not going to be by blood, it's going to be by fruits and vegetables. Because it was organic, I don't know. God rejected it. And in that one moment, Cain established the foundation of the priesthood of darkness. That same priesthood rose up and killed a faithful priest of God, his own brother named Abel. That's at the very foundation of the DNA of the priesthood of darkness. We're kind of seeing it in America today. We're seeing it in China. We're seeing it all over the world. But he said, listen, you're going to have to learn Christ. 
And they had the Septuagint, the Old Testament, to do it with and the power of the Holy Spirit and who Jesus was. And he said it was enough. Now, I'm not discounting the New Testament at all. I'm trying to get the church to realize that the Word of God doesn't begin in Matthew. You know, if I built a roof out here on the ground and talked about what a wonderful building that I had because I'm out there dancing on the roof, you would have thought I have lost my mind. Well, Mike, your building is only three centimeters tall. Now you know why there's a lack of depth in the body of Christ today. There's no foundation, there's no walls, there's no floors, there's nothing but the roof. The Word of God, God's instruction, God's Torah that flows from Genesis to Revelation is the antidote. And we find this same instruction. I want to show you some neat things. Let's go to Joshua chapter 1, verse 7 through 9. Because we're going to see this throughout the Word of God. And I could even have thrown into this Psalms chapter 1. Blessed is he who meditates on the Word of God day and night. He's going to be like he's planted by the living, living uh, low waters, the rivers, and that even his leaf will not wither. That's what happens when you tap into Jesus and tap into the whole Word of God. You can prosper and be blessed even while the whole world is going to hell in a handbasket. Now, you need to understand where Joshua was. How many would, have, would really have a hard time following Moses? I mean, over time they tried to come against them, plagues broke out. Man, then you want to talk about bringing a church in order. Lift up your staff, stuff happens. <laughs> oh man, he's coming down with his stick. You're going to get it now, Jack, you know. How many know that's a hard road to hoe? To follow that. I remember the first time some of the conferences I went to, you know, you had Tom Horn and others speaking, and here's Mike Lake. I'm going to go, bleh, 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 that's all, folks. You know, it's like, how do I follow some of these guys? Well, you just step back and let Jesus do his work. You get out of the way. And that's what God was telling to Joshua. He said, listen, you're going to have to only be strong and courageous that you may observe according to doing all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left hand that you may prosper wherever you go. Now, he didn't say, going to take up an offering. I've got this revelation if you give $999.99 because this is, we're standing on Scripture 999.99 that you're going to get a special blessing. He said you're obedient to the Word. When you're obedient to the Word, you give where you're supposed to give. You help who you're supposed to help because it's all there. And this will make heads explode. You know that your tithe doesn't always have to go in the offering plate. If you see somebody in need and they have nobody else, you take your tithe and you go feed that family. You go clothe that family. You go help that family because the Bible says when you give, Jesus receives the tithe. Did you just hear the pin drop? <laughs> A lot different than today. Okay. But by doing the word brings the blessing. This, law, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you will, shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then you will make your prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you, be strong and be of good courage? Do not be afraid, do not be dismayed, that the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. So there's several things God was teaching here. You study the Word. You memorize the Word. Now a lot of people stop right there. But part of meditating in the Word is first muttering it, going it over and over again in your head because you're trying to figure out its application. And so when, I, when I'm meditating on the Word, I try to see how it will fit into my life. And I'll meditate and I'll see it again and I'll see it again and I see it again and I see it again every time that I'm meditating on it. And if it gets big enough on the inside, you begin doing it on the outside. Our problem is we study this book, but we never see ourselves doing it. It has to get so big on the inside that you begin doing it on the outside. Why? You're rewriting your software. When you rewrite your software, 
You don't have to run from meeting to meeting. You don't have to worry about whatever Ronco Christianity is giving on TV and the promises that you're making. You make your way prosperous by being obedient to the Word of God and the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will show you who to help, how to help them, where to give. Sometimes it'll be money. Sometimes you just need to roll up your sleeves and go to work and help somebody. Did you know that your time can be an offering? Your prayers can be an offering? Wise counsel can be an offering? Because sometimes when you give it, it doesn't stick, and you've got to give it again and again and again and again and again and again. And every time they fall down, you pick them back up, you give it again. That's giving of yourself. You see, there's this concept of hearing and doing. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 27 through 29. Now, I'm not going to fully get through all this, but that's okay because it'll give me a good place to build. If you're hearing and not doing, all you are is a dud. You aim at the devil, but you never pull the trigger. It's like a burglar coming in and say, See my M16? He keeps on studying closer. Have you not seen how I polished my M16? Have you not seen how I've loaded my M16? And as he grabs it out of your hand, you say, But that was mine. You got to pull the trigger to drive out the enemy. Every time you do the word, that is an act of driving him out of your borders. All of life is spiritual warfare. How you think, how you speak, and what you do, if you're doing it right, drives out the enemy and invites God in. Okay? Starting in verse 27. And go near and hear all that the Lord our God may say, and tell us all that the Lord our God says to you, and we will hear it, and we will do it. Over and over again, we will hear, and we will do. We will hear, and we will do. Now, there are a couple of places in the original Hebrew, and it doesn't, and the translators didn't know what to do with it, so they just put it here and do in the English. But there are several places that Israel responded, we will do and we will hear. And the rabbis looked at that and the sages of Israel and said, what on earth does that mean? How can you do before you hear? And then the light came on. Sometimes the only way the word makes sense is when you don't understand it, but you do it and you understand it in retrospect. Say, like, oh, that's what God meant. Oh, that's how I can drive out the devil. Come on now. We got to do the Word of God. And commandments are the instructions of the doing to release your faith. And I've got one minute left, so I'm going to end it right there. Otherwise, I end up with a can of worms I cannot do in 57 seconds. But Father, we ask that you would displace spiritual strength on the inside of us, that we have the courage that we have the courage to do the word. That when everything around us says, that won't work, we have fidelity and we trust and we hold on to you. Even if it's just on our knees, grabbing the hem of the garment, what we have found out from the Gospels is the hem of the garment is enough. We hold on. And we realize she grabbed the tzitzit, which represented Messiah, intertwined in the commandments. She grabbed onto where healing was. Father, give us the strength to hold on with the shaking that's coming. And it will bring stability supernaturally. And Father, let hell itself shake to its very foundations, we ask. In Jesus' name. In the ancient plains of Shinar, an evil was born. The first world king, the prototype transhuman, the ultimate despot, Nimrod. In Babylon, the son of perdition devised the Shinar Directive. 
a plan to enslave humanity and make war against the God of Heaven. God's intervention at the Tower of Babel only delayed Nimrod's hellish plans. As the powers of Mystery Babylon gather to create the new Tower of Babel and to prepare for the Son of Perdition's return, Heaven is issuing a clarion call to the remnant. The Shinar Directive will reveal the strategies of the enemy that will help you untangle yourself from them and become the victorious church. It is time for the remnant to wake up, discern the times, and be infused with Heaven's power to withstand the Shinar Directive by Dr. Michael Lake. Get your copy today at KingdomIntelligenceBriefing.com That's KingdomIntelligenceBriefing.com Thank you for watching Biblical Life TV. We hope and pray that today's program edified you in the Word of God. Stay informed. Tune in to weekly podcasts by Dr. Michael and Mary Lou Lake to keep you informed, inspired, and empowered in the Kingdom of God. Tune in to www.kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. That's kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. This video was made possible by our partners worldwide. Please prayerfully consider supporting the ministry that is preparing the remnant for the unfolding of end times prophecy. Send your offerings to Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri. That's Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri, 65746-0160. You can also donate online at store.biblical-life.com. That's store.biblical-life.com.